steady growth, a margin beat, and a super strong deal pipeline. That is essentially, I mean, the short and sweet as far as the TCS results are concerned. And as always, we have the top team, the top management joining us now. Uh, Mr. K. Krithivasan is CEO at uh, the company, and Mr. N. G. Subramaniam is uh, Chief Operating Officer at TCS. Gentlemen, great to have both of you here. Thank you very much uh, for morning. your time. Good morning. Uh, Krithi, we can start by asking you, are, uh, did it pan out as you thought it would, uh, the third uh, Mostly. The quarter? We did have different, ex slightly different expectations for different markets. Yeah. Uh, UK did very well. Uh, Europe could have done slightly better. Uh, even North America could have better, but I think overall, like uh, more or less in the ballpark. But uh, yes, you see, our margin was we were able to improve our margin by close to 100 bips, mm. and uh, deal wins were all time high. So, all in all, a uh, very satisfying quarter. What was your own internal expectation of growth? You would have been happy around 1.5%. 1.5%. And where has the miss come in compared to your own expectations? You said certain geographies did well, better than expected, certain did not. So vertically and geographically, uh, geographically if you could tell us. See, North America was very flattish. Maybe North, uh, North America expected slightly more. That could have, because North America being a big geography, uh, even a few percentage points better than what we delivered North America could have tilted. Mm. Uh, is, is 2024 looking better? I mean, is it looking like it's picking up? For us, up? FY24 is over. Okay. No, the calendar, I mean. <laughs> no, 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 FY5 <laughs> is over, but the calendar is in front of you. See, as we've been saying, we expect uh, FY25 to be better than FY24. Okay. How much better? I mean, are you, are you getting confidence that, to kind of uh, that put some be, numbers in the that'll ballpark? That will be too early to call at this time. This year has been very different. Like, we've not been able to... Mm. Uh, make a particular, uh, see people are making uh, decisions with, at very short notices, so that would be a different call to make at this time. And just the US market, right, just to, because that's uh, the, the big one, uh, that's doing just fine, I mean, you get the numbers, uh, the data points, the economic data points, jobs number, we got the inflation number, I mean, uh, the problem there is that they want things to slow down, it's not slowing down, and, uh, but it's not translating into to, to orders and sort of spending decisions being quick and firm. Why is that in your opinion and do you think it will pick up? That's the anomaly. Mm -hmm. Really look at it, you know, all the economic indicators are okay. Mm -hmm. And actually if you look at uh, the credit, credit, race, credit rate hikes, mm -hmm. number one, or interest rate hikes, manufacturing is actually doing well. The consumer demand, specifically in the high-end fashion segments, they are all picking up. Mm -hmm. But then that's not translating into discretionary spends on the technology side, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, that's an anomaly that we see in terms of, you know, uh, why certain things are behaving certain manner. The stock market you is know. at all-time high. Yeah, it's I an all-time so. high. Yeah. So, I think it's a, maybe exp it's explained to certain uncertainties like geopolitical situations, the wars, and uh, as well as the uh, election thing that's going on. Uh, I think it should ease out, but uh, I'm not seeing anything fundamentally wrong with our customers. They're you all. Know, the question is, if higher interest, the big thing is higher interest rates in the U.S., right? Five and a quarter percent. If higher interest rates have not hurt, whenever interest rates come down, will they help? That's a, I mean, that's precisely the point. Whatever models we all had, hmm. whether it's from an economic perspective or from our own uh, uh, internal modeling of uh, how that will translate into budget spend, etc. They're all, you know, there's some anomaly, which, is, which means that there's something which is happening, which, uh, which is uh, influencing the decisions. I would attribute it to very, very fast pace of technology maturity and technology change, right? Mm -hmm. If you take Gen AI, you know, every day there is something new happening there. If you take cybersecurity, the threats are getting uh, bigger and bigger every day, and so people are investing in these areas, mm -hmm. right? So I think, you know, what everybody is looking at it is, okay, let's look at the war, let's look at what's going to happen in the Middle East, what's happening in the Ukraine side. Almost every, may, all major markets, if you look at it, there's an election, right? So let's see how these things pan out and should we really invest in Asia, should we really invest in North America itself, right? So many, many uh, uh, variations that uh, are going through our customers' minds which actually can is the only reason that I can put in terms of explaining why they are uh, holding back some of this. At the same time, the, the AI in this, as a centerpiece 
the architectures are changing, right? And uh, they want to see, make sure that the architecture that they choose and a multi-cloud strategy that they choose and um, the resilience that they want to bring in into the overall technology, all that, uh, they want to probably assess and make sure they get it right, right? Before they so that step is up the gas. delaying things. I think so. I think, you know, basically there is a first phase of any new technology transformation, if you look at it, getting the architecture right. And have we got the multi-cloud strategies right? Is there a scope for a private cloud in the overall multi-cloud strategy? How do we use the LLMs? And what part of my data that I don't mind sharing it outside? What point of data and what point of part of the competitive advantage that I want to keep it inside? See, there are multiple things at play. So all that uh, probably is uh, taking that uh, decision a little... Uh, but that's very well explained, uh, NGS, to understand why spending is taking time. Uh, but Kriti, uh, discretionary spending, has it further deteriorated? Because Accenture spoke about it. See, if you look at again from our deal wins, okay, we, recorded, we reported a huge, significant deal win. And uh, if you cut that, right, about still about 55% of that is uh, new, uh, new uh, or discretionary spend. And about 60% could be uh, non-discretionary. Again, non-discretionary could be in terms of some of them or maybe renewals, some of them or uh, regulatory changes, if you can put it. So I won't say it's a drastic reduction. Like people are uh, wanting to spend, but at the same time, like NGS mentioned, like uh, they also want to console. Like if things turn, see, if things turn around to be good, if they all can't become confident the economy is going to grow faster, they need to be ready to sprint and uh, ready for the transformation. So there is a certain amount of getting fit also being done. So I won't call it a the discretionary spend is uh, decisions are being made. Uh, I don't think there is a huge slowness, right? It's, uh, but the, what is happening is the whole projects, we keep talking about it. There is a slowdown or pause of the whole projects where they don't see the ROI. That's a continuing trend. Okay. Uh, and margins, are margins sustainable at 26% according to you, except for the decline that we'll see in Q1 because of wage hikes. But uh, other than that? We believe structurally it's a sustainable margin. Like uh, we worked hard to get here and uh, we'll work hard to stay here. On, on just to, uh, a personal point on AI, because that's a big, big thing which is happening, right? And everything is in a flux, as I think if I paraphrase uh, what NGS told us. Is it a net? Uh, how, uh, how far out from when we are able to kind of sort of start talking about projects on that side? How, when does it become a net positive? When, when does it stop delaying projects and how far out are we, you think? See, like there are a lot of experiments going on, a lot of exploratory work going on. Like as of today, we, I believe we are doing close to about 200 plus engagements and our pipeline on this one is close to 900 million A plus Gen A together. So there is a lot of activity going on. And uh, as like with any other hype cycle, there will be some realization on what is the art of possible here, what you should do with Gen A, what you should not try to do with Gen A, because it's fairly a compute intense technology. It's not going to come cheap. People also try to understand how expensive it is or where, the, where are the economic benefits. Uh, it will probably take few more quarters, right, uh, for them to understand which are the appropriate use cases uh, for this uh, technology. Uh, just to get the number and right, $900 million is pipeline, the pipeline, pipeline yeah. for AI and generative Gen AI. AI. Yeah. Okay. Uh, NGS, particularly on communications, right? This quarter, communications on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis appears to have fallen slightly. But one would have thought the ramp-up of the BSNL deal would have contributed positively. So are there any other clients in communication where there is pressure or what explains uh, the performance? Well, BSNL that is not reported under communication. BSNL gets okay. reported under regional markets. Eh? Okay. But in the verticals, it's... Our oh, vertical is you have CMI okay. and the regional markets includes India. It gets in, uh, included okay. in Which India. is up 26% on That's a year-on-year year, yeah. uh, basis. Okay. And what about not, uh, sorry, BFSI? Uh, you know, BFSI is still flat. Uh, the last time we spoke, I think there was hope that there are green shoots in BFSI and they'll start improving. I think, you know, overall uh, um, uh, the deal uh, momentum is there. We have done about close to about 4.5 billion mm. uh, out of the overall 13 plus billion is from BFSI, right? Um, but as I said, 
you know, BFSI is one of the segments which is very quick to adopt technology, which is the one which tries out everything new. Uh, in that context, I think the artificial intelligence, multi-cloud, and uh, uh, things like you know sustainable financing, Basel III kind of uh, experimentation that they have to do. Many such areas is something that we are participating. Uh, but then all this will, the momentum will pick up as they finalize the first phase of saying that this is how I want to do things. This is the way that you know it has to be, uh, let's say, disaggregated or this is the way that it has to be aggregated for dashboards and MIS purposes and all of that. So I think there's nothing wrong which we see in our customer base. We are engaging with them very positively. But there is a certain amount of caution in terms of, look, where is it it's, uh, the, the geopolitical risks are uh, going? And uh, where the technology side of it, how am I going to actually get it right? Because every time they do, when they accelerate it, you know, uh, if something new happens, then the question comes back saying that, have you made the right decision on the architecture, right? Okay. So I think that's the way that I think uh, there are some delays. But overall, I don't see anything wrong with the banking financial services sector, especially in our client portfolio. Would you say AI is the biggest, would both of you agree, is the biggest sort of X factor in that sense, which will determine how fast things come back? Um, I would say yes, yeah, from both positive perspective and a certain amount of pessimism which is there. See, um, if you really look at it, there are regulations that are being talked about on AI. Mm. Right? So everyone is now looking at AI for internal use. Right? But at the same time, if I'm going to uh, make use of the artificial intelligence for customer facing situations, there are two things that we have to answer. One is that we have to make it responsible. Second is that if regulation comes and does something, and then you know how am I going to roll it back? Or you know, so that in from that perspective, all the efficiency-related use cases internally that is happening is what is the focus. While they are you they mean really within, within TCS, with, but customer facing. You know, not only within TCS, within, right. within the customer, okay. let's say back office efficiencies sure. Sure. or technology efficiencies okay. that they can do, they're all fine, right? But if I'm going to make that analytics to put to use for, let's say, interacting with customers better mm. or uh, making the customer interactions much more efficient, etc. Mm. There is some tentativeness because the models which they are planning to use, will they be regulated or if they regulate it, then what will be the impact? Am I going too much far ahead and then, you know, it will be difficult for me to pull it back later? So there is certain amount of caution in all of that, right? So anything on AI that we see, it's largely related to internal efficiencies in each of the enterprises and organizations. While they want to experiment on the front and uh, be ready um, with, the, with the experiments so that if there is a regulation or the regulation is very clear or the, uh, the responsible algorithms as we call it, um, there is still a certain amount of research that is going on. What, how, when do you call an algorithm responsible, right? Okay. So that those things are uncertainties and they are, I would say, enjoying the uncertainty at this point in time. But it will have to get quicker as uh, things get improved.